Kevin Jackson Radio Show. What's up, everybody? Kevin Jackson here. It is the Kevin Jackson Show. KJRadio.com. Glad you're with me. I got a question for you. What happens when the left doesn't get Manafort? They are laser focused on this man. They do not want him to get away. They are going back to 2006. We talked about it yesterday. And get, get this. It has nothing to do with Donald Trump. So shouldn't the special counsel have to leave that part of the investigation alone? Isn't he looking at data of Manafort that he has no reason to be looking into if the scope of his work is how does Manafort relate to Donald Trump? This is an investigation that happened long before, long before Trump even probably considered running for president. Why are we here? You answer that question. You know, I, I just want to know when they have nothing left of Russia. And by the way, they have nothing left of Russia. But when it's official, what do they do? Who can I run to? That was an old uh, uh, song. Who was it? The, the girls that sang that song. Very popular band in the 60s. Uh, in the 70s, I mean. What you think? No, it wasn't them. But anyway, uh, the emotions. Yeah, who can I run to? Who can you run to, left? You got nowhere to go. The song was, who can I run to when I need love? <laughs> oh, man. Hey, you conservatives listening to radio right now, you can run to me. When you need love, you can come talk to me. I, I, I love you guys. I really do. I love everything about you. I love you. I have loved you and I, before I even knew you. And here's what's cool. In 2009, when we officially met, <laughs> I, it grew. Then 2010, you really made me love you because you, you know, you, you know the old song, you made me love you, but I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, but I did it because you voted out the Congress for Barack Obama. And then in 2014, you made me love you even harder <laughs> because you voted in the Senate. You gave us we you people and i use that in the in the most endearing sense of the words you people made me love you you were ordinary you weren't that good to look at necessarily but you you wore me down (laughs) and maybe i did the same to you because i ain't all that in the bag of chips either i'll admit it (laughs) but yeah we wore each other down we we started going you know what you're starting to look cute it's starting to look good to me. Have you ever had that happen? Like somebody that just maybe wasn't your type, but they hung around. They were funny. They were engaging. And, you know, they, they were down to earth. And you just found yourself going, doggone it. Right before my eyes, right under my nose. Well, that's how you guys were. See, I was cruising along, management consultant, not a care in the world, making money. Getting it taken away from me like a mania. I mean, the government was, they might as well just come over and ski mask and rob me at night. I was getting hosed. I didn't know who to love. I was looking around, looking for love in all the wrong places. (laughs) Looking for love in too many faces. Searching for lies. (laughs) And so you guys walked into my life and went, hey, hey. We love you, man. I was like, ah, you know, I know you say that. I've heard it before. I'm not all that attracted to you right now because I was busy. I was trying to build my career and all that other stuff. And 2009 came along and you made me love you. And I hope I'm making you love. I'm, I hope I'm giving back. It, we're trying to meet you halfway. You don't want to be in a relationship where you're not in bed halfway. You're not, you don't. It's just not good for you. If you, it's like I tell my sons, I would say, look, I don't care who you pursue, but here's the thing. It must be equal pursuit. And even if you have to make it equal, you can go, man, I'm crazy, but I don't care. And that's a healthy way to be. By the way, that's the way psychologists tell you. You do things for people because you want to, you love doing it. That's great. I I don't have a problem with that necessarily, but don't come crying to me. Don't come crying to me. You should be, if somebody, if you're overdoing it for a while, you need to back off and go, you know what? I'm going to step back. I'm going to slow my roll, pump the brakes, and I'm going to let them come do a few things for me. Just a test. 
You know, they'll that remember the movie uh, where they had the reach over test as a girl when he put the girl in the car, opened the door for her. Did she reach over to unlock his door? Now, you can't do that anymore unless you got an old ride. <laughs> but most cars now, she just hits the button. Click. But liberal women won't even hit the button. Y'all think I'm kidding you. They'll wait for you to hit your lock, your, your little auto thing to click, click. They'll wait on that. They won't even hit the button. Too lazy to hit the button. They know what I'm talking. <laughs> there are people out there. Y'all are dating liberals, married to liberals, whatever. A dude or a girl doesn't matter. And you know what I'm telling you is the truth. Too lazy. They expect you to do everything. Do nothing but complain about you. You work. You come home. You clean. You take care of the kids. You pick up dog doo doo. You take the trash out. You cook. You do it all. And you know what they do? Yeah, well, you didn't put my shoes on. Why didn't you put my shoes away? Or whatever. Or they complain about the food that's cooked. Or that you didn't buy. You messed their order up when you brought it back from the restaurant. Or you tell them you're going to take them out. Oh, we go here all the time. Why couldn't you pick somebody? Where else? Why we got to keep going to the same place? They always got an excuse. That's why I don't like to tolerate them. Oh, yeah. Come on. We're just having fun with leftists. We, I know they listen to the program. That's the deal. We got a lot to talk about today. You know, the Manafort thing to me, it, it's so old in the sense that we've already been, we, we, we've been tipped off to it. What is there to say? Is that it? The litany of people, they, oh, Russians, give me some Russians. I want to know Sergei and Vladimir and Pushtakov and Nastasia and Vitali. And I want to know some Russians that are involved in this. I'm Paul, come on. You want to convince me that Paul, Paul did it. Paul's the guilty one. Come on, well, you could be more creative than that leftist. I mean, well, he worked with a Russian bank that was uh, doing this or that. He's a businessman doing business in the in Ukraine. What are you talking about? He oh he worked. What he, did he help Putin invade Crimea? Man, maybe we can get him on that. Oh, by the way, there's no Trump. Where's Donald Trump's complicitness, involvement? He's not involved. Hmm. That's interesting. Anyway, we got a lot to talk about. Google. Google is admitting something, and I'm going to explain it here in just a bit. Morgan Freeman and the Russians. What's that connection? <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> There's a military base we put up. Oh, this is a good one. I got I to I gotta wait. I got to hustle. I got to get out of here. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville. Author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. Kevin J. 
Jackson Radio Show. All right, everybody, welcome back. Kevin Jackson here. I'm about to share a story with you that will, I don't know, it'll probably incense you, but I'm going to warn you. I want you to put your smile on your face and I want you to chuckle over this and I want you to understand what this guy's trying to do. See, because leftists want to offend us on the Kevin Jackson show. They want us to discuss their craziness and we will. Because I need you to know how they are. But at the same time, I'm not going to allow us to get caught up in this. I'm not going to allow us to trip, as we say, in the vernacular. But this story, I promise you, will make you mad. If you are a Christian as I am, it's going to upset you a bit. It, because it's an attempt to get to your sensibilities. And I'm warning you up front. It's not a trigger warning. I'm just telling you, we're going to handle this differently today. We're not going to let this get to us. So what it is, is we have our Bible, right? And we have multiple different types of this Bible. King James Version, blah, 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 all these different ones. And we're okay with that because sometimes the Bible needs to be simplified. There's a simplified version that lets people, you know, it doesn't speak in Bible speak and sort of breaks things down. And then you got to go out and you got to do your research and you have to interpret it because there are a lot of fake news people out there. Charlatans, people that will tell you, the, you know, act like they know the word of God as if they, they wrote it themselves. They don't know what God meant, but it's up for you for interpretation because you have to understand your world and understand what would you do if you were looking for perfection in something. And sometimes that can be difficult to figure out. And that's because we've been secularized. We, we sometimes don't always know right from wrong. We don't. And, and the other part of it is this. We don't know God's plan. I was having this discussion. In fact, we'll probably... I'll talk about this a little bit, but it's, uh, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine and he was talking about, you know, would you give your life for Christ? Like if, if you were going to get your head cut off by a Muslim and he says, I'll let you live if you denounce Christianity and say, I'm going to convert to, to, uh, Islam, I'll let you live. Anyway, we'll get into that discussion a bit later, but so all I'm getting at is this, we have a Bible. It's a living Bible. They call it the living Bible. And it teaches you right from wrong. And you know it. You know it inherently. There may be some areas where you go, hmm, I'm not sure. But that's generally because you are in conflict with yourself. You know the way of righteousness. You really do. So there's a, a gay guy. And he uh, has written a gay Bible. And his name is uh, Daniel something. And he wrote a book that he got somewhat famous for uh, becoming Michigan's quote, mayor of hell for a day. And his last name is Daniel. I don't know his first name. Oh, Elijah. And he rewrote the Christian Bible to feature people like Taylor Swift, Donald Trump and Rihanna in an erotic religious text. And you can look up this story. It's in the independent. The Bible describes Rihanna as a godlike figure who created the world like Jesus, turned water into wine, while Trump plays the role of Satan. Now, I just want, again, I'm telling you, this is meant to offend your sensibilities. It's meant to get a rise out of you. And you can bet it's going to have all kinds of gay nonsense in there just because they want to do it. In fact, he, uh, I think his advertisement for it, the Bible, only gayer. That was his, and you can buy it at his website. And the brouhaha that's come up over, over this is be, because they, Amazon, Amazon, Jeff Bezos' leftist utopia took his book down. Now, I don't know how they took I don't know whether a bunch of Christians got together and said, look, we've had it. I'd love us to. I'd love to hit Amazon right in the naughty bits with a jack boot. You know, that's a steel tip version of the boot. I would love to get that, you know, hit Bezos right where the good Lord split him because he deserves it. But they took it down. And this this gay dude's like, why'd they take it down? I don't understand. It's censorship. Yeah, it's all censorship now. He's upset. He's being censored. Hmm. 
The book held the number one spot in Christian eBooks and Bible sales for a short stint, but it got removed from Amazon's site. Now, they consider this book a Christian book. I can practically guarantee you that no serious Christian bought this drivel. No serious Christian. Look, I don't care about the, you know, what do they call it? Living the, they, there's the different Bible versions and I have a King James version, but, and there's like a, a NJV or something like that. I forget the names of these things, but it's easier to understand. I get it. I don't really like those Bibles because I, I think you should hear the scripture as closely as you can. And then some people would argue, well, Kevin, the new, the King James version isn't exactly the closest scripture. I mean, you have to go back to this. Look, I'm not trying to get the Bible translated from Hebrew. I'm just saying, give me a consistent Bible. When we quote, at least it kind of matches up. I don't need regular speak. I can read Shakespeare too. You get what I'm saying? But this guy has essentially bastardized the Bible. He's torn it apart, ripped it to shreds, because that's what the LGBT wants to do, by the way. They do not like that Christians really believe in something bigger than themselves. Because for the left, there is nothing bigger than self. I'm Alec Baldwin. I'm a star. How can you get bigger than this? How much more important can you be in the world? Mother Teresa? Gandhi? Who are you? You can't command the crowds that I command. You don't live the way that I live. That's how leftists think. They don't think about, you know, what's important in life. The only time they do that, folks, is at the very end. Tell them you've got cancer and you've got six months to live. Suddenly they find to me, all of this is no longer important. I now realize it. Let me tell you something. If you don't realize that now, shame on you. I have a friend made of money. He spends it. He says, I'm entertaining my friends. This is what it's about. Bringing my friends together. And it's not like MC Hammer where we're going to break him. It's things where he wants everybody feeding off of everybody else. And he says, he's got us all, you know, really caring about one another and finding out how people are doing. It's amazing. I love this guy. Anyway, back to this. Here was my question. Do you think Elijah Daniel would take the Quran and gay it up? Just curious. People listening to the Kevin Jackson show. By the way, if you want to contact me and give me your opinion about this, 844-551-8255. Give me a call or kjradio.com. Send us a note. Send us, get, contact us on Facebook. I want to know if you think Eliza Daniel, gay boy who says the Bible only gayer, will do the Quran only gayer. Now, I don't, I personally would, if I was in, in the mood, I'd do it. But here's the thing. I'm not going to talk smack about somebody's holy book in the sense of changing it up. I don't care about Islam. I don't care about talking about Muslims and all that. I'll talk about that crap all day. But I'm not going to defile what somebody wants to find holy just for shiggles. And that's what this guy's done to us. Shame on him. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. So we were talking about this uh, this jag, Elijah Daniel, gay Elijah Daniel, who has decided that he will write a uh, Bible uh, that mocks essentially the Christian Bible. And I don't know what he called it. But does it really matter? And And here's the thing. Leftists love to mock Christianity, and they do it all the time. And the we're mockable. As Christians, we're very mockable. Well, you want to know why? Because our religion is impervious to ridicule. Mock away, I say. Oh, no, maka, 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 you can mock the Christianity as you want to. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You cannot break us. So, Elijah Daniel, which, by the way, his name does not go unnoticed on me that he chooses two biblical names and i'm i'm going to say what his twitter name i'm it looks like fagdad okay 
I'm just going to leave it there. But that's his Twitter name, uh, Elijah Daniel. That's that's what he calls himself. And on his Twitter page, it he writes, Elijah Daniel is gay. And I truly do find it fascinating that of all the things that a person can reveal about oneself, most gay people choose sexuality. You know, if I come up and meet somebody and he's well-dressed, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a friend. His name is Jeff. First time I met Jeff, I thought, man, this dude is sharp. Sharp. And what's funny, I noticed him. He, 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 I, you, you know how you watch people watch their eyes a little bit? He looked at my tie, my pen, and my shoes. I noticed it. He was coming down the stairs. I went. He was one of my distributors. Had never met him. Had heard of his reputation. Great sales guy. And I wanted to meet him. I'm signing up in the lobby as I'm getting all signed up. I've got my, you know, um, I've got a, a Waterman pen. I've got a nice tie on, nice suit, you know, nice pair of shoes. He, zoop, 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 that quick. He looked and he's and he uh, says something like, you know, hey, nice to meet you, Kevin. He goes, I like that tie. And he goes, come on, I've got the conference room reserved. And we go up. And it was two years. I worked with Jeff on multiple deals. And there wasn't a time you see this guy. He wasn't stylishly appointed. I mean, just a great dresser, always highly professional. It was two years and we worked the deal out at BASF. He brought everybody in. And it was like, a, I don't know, three or four months later, I offered him a job. And he says, I need to tell you I'm gay. And I go, I know. And he was shocked. But here's what I love about telling you this story. I knew Jeff a long time. I didn't know he lived with Jerry. You know, we'd go to dinner. I'd say, hey, why don't you bring your, you know, bring your mate. (laughs) I'd say things like that. Oh, you know, busy, you know, whatever. It'll just be us. But, but I I never pushed the issue. And when I find I offered him a job and then he, you know, he says, I need to tell you I'm gay. And I go, I know you're gay. Now, he knew I was completely straight and, of course, knew my politics. And one of the things he told me, he goes, Kevin, I'm very, you know, out there when it comes to gay issues. And I said, look, what you do on your personal time, as long as it has no impact on your ability to do business, which I haven't seen it, then I don't really care. And I think he found it shocking that this conservative felt that way. But I did. And I still do. Jeff was one of the sharpest guys I've ever met to this day and I would put his sales ability up against the best of the best. That's what I knew him for. I didn't know him because he and Jerry liked to, you know, do the, you know, the Humpty dance or whatever. It didn't matter. If, if Jerry made him happy, I'm cool with that. Eventually I meet Jerry, nice guy, blah, blah, blah. Invite me to parties, his gay friends. Oh, he's so cute. Yeah, fine. Yeah, he's very heterosexual. That's it. So, but but the, this idea that I screw men and men screw me, that's my pride. Daniel's parents must be so proud of him. Look at our little boy all grown up and having sex with men. Oh, I just don't know how to handle it. Oh, honey, we raised him right. How small must a person feel that he introduces himself to the world in that way? I'm going to get to something else. I want to keep talking about this guy, Gay Daniel. Gay Daniel has over 500,000 Twitter followers, folks. Let me put that in perspective. I have 56,000. So it's not a small feat to do that. Now, could I have half a million? Sure, if I put a lot of emphasis on it and whatever, probably. But I didn't. So he's got exponentially more people on Twitter than I do. So he's well known in his circles. And what they know of the man is that he's gay. Says it right on his page. King of the gays. Of all things, one can tout, folks. Humanitarianism, philanthropy, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, I'm a doctor, I'm a painter, I'm a student, I'm a professor, I'm a free spirit, a bon vivant. Daniel chooses, Baghdad, Elijah Daniel as his moniker, and touts his sexuality. Elijah Daniel is gay. Go to this page. You'll see it. I say to Elijah Daniel, That his choice of not one but two biblical names also proves to me that he wants to mock 
Christianity. I don't believe that's his given name. So he mocks us. And I told you guys he made Trump Satan in this. I'm, I'm going to get to another point here in a minute, but he made Trump Satan. And I, and I think this guy just is looking for 15 seconds of fame, 15 minutes of fame. Congratulations, gay Daniel. You're getting it. Trump is Satan. Who couldn't see that coming a mile away, though, right? Gives new meaning to Donald Trump's apprentice catchphrase, you fired. Now, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, man. So I, I talked about Daniel. And I know people are saying to me, Kevin, why are you giving this guy publicity? And I say, why not? Leftists believe, folks, that their ideas will stand the scrutiny of the public. They do. They, he believes that he is doing the right thing mocking Christianity. He's teaching us a lesson. He's saying to us, you people out there that believe in this nonsense, you hate gays, you did it, because he's completely distorted in what we believe. So now he's lashing out at us. I'll get back at them. I'll undo thousands of years of dogma <laughs> by coming out and say not I mean unintentionally, coming out and saying to these people, you're wrong. Your God is dead. No, no, no whatever. So I like showcasing their lunacy. People need to know how twisted the left really is because I'm going to tell you, you don't know. Oh, you think you know, but you don't know how twisted the left is. I assure you. Now, I told you the other day that in gay Daniel's world, Rihanna is a god. She's God. She is his God. And again, Trump is the antithesis of God in his world, therefore Satan. Now, I'm shocked he didn't make Barack Obama God, but you know Daniel's got his own world here, so let's run with it, okay? Now, he's writing his truth. Because, you know, leftists are quick to point out, look, this is my truth. You know, how are you going to go against me, man? This is my life. This is my truth. Okay. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Let me back. Let me back up, bro. Let me back up. This your truth. <laughs> So Rihanna, a chick from the West Indies, is his truth, is his God. Donald Trump, who now pre now that he's president, is Satan. I don't believe Donald Trump would have been Satan in his novel had Donald Trump not become president, beaten Hillary Clinton, etc. I think he'd pick another Satan. He would pick another Satan that he could hopefully get 15 seconds of fame off of, or 15 minutes. So... I just wanted to talk about his truth for just a second. So his God is Rihanna. <laughs> and his God got her butt kicked by a hip hop artist by the name of Chris Brown. I just want to put his God in perspective. And then she sought therapy. Chris Brown, you know, went and did his penance and, you know, abuse and, you know, whatever. He, he had to go to do his time for domestic abuse and what have you. And all as well. Now, I don't know about Rihanna as God, but I'll put it to you this way. I will tell you with 100% certainty that Chris Brown cannot beat up our God, the Christian God. <laughs> he can't. He may be tough. I heard he, I heard he works out. I heard he does a little boxing, <laughs> but he can't beat our guy. Our dude is tough. I'm going to get to why I'm talking about this all in a second. Because I want to ask you a question about your Christianity. And I think it's important. It came up in a discussion that I had with a friend. And I'm going to save it for the next segment. But this is why I'm, le I'm talking about this subject again. Because I, I only wanted to cover it in one segment. But now I'm, I'm going farther here. Anyway, I'm glad that I met Gay Daniel on, the, uh, on this little research project that I had. He told me all about himself. So I'm going to forever call him Gay Daniel. Because I think it's important that he be recognized for what he wants to be recognized. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. 
Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. As you guys know, there are three things that you should not discuss in public, in company. What do they say? In good company or something like that? It is religion, sex, and politics. So welcome to the Kevin Jackson Show where we will discuss religion, sex, and politics <laughs> quite extensively. And I'm coming off the heels of this discussion around gay Elijah Daniel. And I, the reason why I did two segments on that on that subject that I only planned on doing one is I wanted to sort of segue into another discussion that I had with a friend of mine who is uh he's an agnostic and he says uh we were having this discussion around would you denounce Christ to save yourself from Islam you know in other words somebody's got a a knife to your throat and they're like if you say that you now love the Quran, you love uh, uh, Allah, and you will denounce Christ, then you can live. And so this friend of mine, who's a radio show host, very popular one, he says, of course I denounce Christ. He goes, Christ would know that when I got to heaven afterwards, you know, dying of a natural death somewhere along the way, that I didn't mean that, that I only said that for that reason. And I, you know, so I, okay, I get it. I can understand an agnostic saying that. And so I said to him, well, it really, that's not the case, man. You know, I said that what, what life is about, it's a series of tests for you. And and here's my theory. I don't know if you guys may disagree. If you want to chime in on this, contact me at kjradio.com or call the show at 844 844- Five five one eighty two fifty five. But here's what I said. I said, look, it's a test. When you were in your mother's womb, you in another world, you had no ability to make right, wrong decisions, whatever. All the decisions that were made for you in that world were made by the organism that played God to you. And that organism was your mother. If she had taken drugs, you took drugs. She smoked, you smoked, etc. She determined if you're going to be born, she literally had the pro- the ability of life and death over you and she lets you be born. But once you get born into the world, into God's world, it's all God's world, but you know, go, go with me on this. You now have ability to choose. You can choose going in the way of temptation, going in the way of doing wrong or whatever, or you cannot. And to believe that there's nothing beyond this is really pretty. I find it interesting given that I've already proven to most people in my, my first book, the big black lie, I talk about this subject and say, if you don't know how you got born into this world, how do you not, how do you not, why can you not believe that there's, you're going to pop out of some, some big, the equivalent of a vagina into another new world. How do you not know that we call her mother earth? Why can't mother earth birth us into a whole nother realm That we know nothing about. We search the cosmos and we're fascinated by the the distance of light years that things are away. And how will we ever time travel and get to this or that? We've got, you know, satellites taking pictures of things up in space. And we can't believe that there's something else. And all this vastness, we can't believe. And we can't figure, I'm talking about as agnostics. And we can't figure out that there's probably something beyond this that we want to go to. You know, oh, Kevin, I can't believe that we're all going to burn in hell if we do this. OK, fine. Look, I I get that the imagery may hell is a whole different concept 
when you think about heaven. So is heaven, by the way. You may say, oh, man, my little drop of heaven is when I'm sitting along a stream, you know, the campsite with a fire going and we're singing Kumbaya and roasting marshmallows. Okay, trust me, that ain't the heaven we're talking about. But that may be your definition of heaven. Your definition of hell may may be what the Bible conjures or what somebody tells you. Who knows? But all I can tell you is hell can be ripped, can be brought to you in a lot of ways. So back to what you denounce. So my buddy admits that he shied away from religion. He says, uh, uh, and it's dogmatic, even under the most dire circumstances that one could, that one should be able to denounce his or her faith in order to survive. So I said to him, so in other words, worldly life is all there is for you. See, that's what you're saying. He's saying the only thing that matters in life is this life. If I don't believe, if I don't believe in this other thing, I have to fight for this life with all the gusto I have. And I think to myself, dude, everybody dies. Everybody's going to die. I don't care how long man works to preserve himself. Uh, one day man will live to be 200 years old and he will regret it. He will regret it. I mean, think of all the, the you know, oh, well, Kevin, if I could live to be 200 and still feel like I'm 20, you still wouldn't want it. Believe me, think it through. Think of all the aspects of life beyond what you realize it to be. This finite thing that ends in, you know, 70, 80, 90 years old, whatever, whatever that number is. Think about how you've rationalized birth and death and all the things in between as it is now. So if you do believe that worldly life is all there is, then I agree. If a Muslim wants to cut off your head, you better say whatever it takes for them to say it. But for me, it's a short-sighted view because it implies that the only threat from Islam I would face is that moment, right? It, it, he, he says to me, Kevin, I'll, I won't cut off your head if you denounce Christ. Okay, I denounce Christ. Now you're part of Islam. So what that means is everybody around the world is doing this. Everybody's denouncing Christ. So we're going to live under the caliphate. All right. We will succumb to Islam. What happens to your way of life? Now, as a guy, as I could, I told this to a feminist the other day. I said, hey, look, as a guy, I would love to go to Islam just to shut you feminist up <laughs> because then you have no voice. Do you understand it by not going to Islam? I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for your crazy views. I'm fighting for the ability for you to say, I hate men. That's what I'm fighting for. <laughs> I'm fighting for you to believe that men are oppressing you in all kinds of ways because I want to keep you from an oppression you don't even realize. But here's the real question. What do you teach somebody when you don't stand up for something because he says to me Kevin would you say that of your sons if they were to be faced with that and I said yes see now it, with my kids and I go okay so let's just go there so you have something you believe in right you believe in your children right yeah okay do you think that the Bundys believed in Ted <laughs> Do you believe that Gacy, the Gacy's believed in Gacy? Do you believe that the Dahmers believed in Jeffrey Dahmer? If you want to believe in your children as your, you know, as, as some savior thing, you are out of your mind. But here's what's interesting. The ch I'm just telling you, kids are going to let you down the same way parents are going to let down kids. We can believe in each other in the sense that I'll back you. And I tell my kids all the time. You know, I've had issues with my oldest son for years. I mean, we we've had, you know, a relationship that's strained. It, it continues to be and through no fault of my own. I'll be honest with you. It's not a fault of my own. It's some growing up that he has to do. But I tell him, here's what you can know in the world. No matter what, there's somebody willing to give their life for you. Somebody out there will jump in front of a bullet to save your life, will jump in front of a car, will fight 50 people to save your life. That's your dad, because I'll do that in a minute. Now, do you believe they could believe that about me if I would denounce Christ? Because <laughs> it's easy to talk about, oh, uh, my life is, you know, is when it comes to my kids, my life is this or that. Really? Prove it to me. 
Because if you don't understand there's something bigger than you, that something awaits you that's bigger than you, and you won't give your life for that, and you t- you want to convince you, Kevin, I'd give my life for you. I'm not convinced. See, he can be convinced. If I tell you, I'll give my life for you, I'll give my life for you. You don't have to guess. I'm in it. Under pressure, this guy is saying to me, I'll do what it takes to survive. Because this life is all I got. That's what he's telling you. And no matter how many ways he wants to convince you, this buddy of mine, oh, no, no, no. When it comes to my kids or protecting my wife or what? No, you won't. No, you won't. You'll let it go. Because in the back of your mind, you know what you're saying? This is all I got. And he's sitting there going, well, what? What? If you won't do it for something that's bigger than you, you're telling me this is bigger than you? You you want me to believe that protecting your family is bigger than you. But I don't believe it because if you won't protect something that doesn't that you believe doesn't exist, if you can't protect this bigger ideal, you won't protect the other stuff. I know that. I know cowards. Cuz I'm not one. Anyway, I'm curious what you guys think. Let me know. It's Kevin Jackson show back in a bit. won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome, everybody. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. Glad you guys are with me. Let's kick things off um, with a statement by uh, Chelsea Handler. I'm going to do some uh, listener mail here in a second, but I want to start off with Chelsea Handler, who called Stacey Dash. If you don't know Stacey Dash, she's a beautiful lady, uh, was in some show with Alicia Silverstone years ago. Uh, I forget the name of the show. It was a high school type flick and got famous for that. But she's, you know, she's been in Hollywood for a long time. Outspoken conservative, black conservative. And I will tell you, right of Reagan, I know personally that she, her views are, it was, I was in a couple of sessions with her once on Hannity and one somewhere else. And I was shocked at how Stacy is just so to the right. She gets it. And I mean, to her core, she gets it unabashed, unafraid. Love that about her. But Chelsea Handler called her a black white supremacist. And the reason why I bring this up is to explain to you how crazy liberalism is. By the way, if you know what a black white supremacist is, please contact us at kjradio.com or call the show 844-551-8255. If you've ever seen a black white supremacist, I'd love to see it. It would be like, I don't know, spotting the Yeti or a black man riding a unicorn. I don't know. Maybe just a unicorn. (laughs) But yeah, tell me what that is. A black white supremacist, a lady who would dare say, I can think for myself. I'm not going to toe the line and go to where the other black folks are. And Chelsea Handler can't allow a woman, a grown woman to have her own point of view without giving her a label. And the label is black, white supremacist. Yeah. She, you know, I guess she's the, uh, what's his name? Clayton Bigsby, a leading the clan, a black woman leading a bunch of white people in the clan. Which, by the way, what would be so bad about that? It would be a woman in charge and a black woman in charge of that. Leading a, a bunch of racists, you would think that Chelsea Handler would think that was a nice thing. That it was a good thing. It was progress. Wouldn't that be progress, progressives? Remember when George Zimmerman was called a white Hispanic? Had you ever heard that term before? I knew Hispanics were from the Caucasian side of things. In other words, Spaniards were, are considered white versus Mexicans, per se. And even Mexicans, uh, theoretically, are not black. They're certainly not black, right? They're, they're his Latino. But they fall under Hispanic, which, of course, is Caucasian. I get it. But I'd never heard the term white Caucasian until George Zimmerman. And you want to know why? Because George Zimmerman looked like a Hispanic. And when he and Trayvon Martin had the run in, the left could not handle 
the idea that it there was this Hispanic dude to kill the black dude. So they called him a white Hispanic because to put white in front of it, colorized it more so that people would be outraged. And they were. Many people had never seen George Zimmerman. He His name is Zimmerman. So they were like, oh, this crazy white dude, man. He killing brothers. Uh, yeah, well, he wasn't white. George Zimmerman was like, I, I don't know, Guatemalan or something. He wasn't a Guatemalan midget, <laughs> but he's a Guatemalan. He was, you know, something of Hispanic origin. And they called him a white Hispanic. Never in the history of my being had I ever heard the term until then. Chelsea Handler also called Ben Carson a racist. Not the only one to call him that. Now, in black talk, you know, when the left are talking about other black people and they're out there spewing actual racism, you know what they they say? Oh, black people can't be racist. They don't have any power. Which is nonsense. Black people are the most racist people in America. And they're openly racist. It has become black people in America have become exactly what they detested, what we fought against decades ago, 100 years ago in the mid 1800s. They become exactly that, only more bold, more bold. They don't go back in the deep of night and put on black hoods and come out and, you know, and say, what you doing there, white boy? I'm going to kick your butt or whatever. They don't do that. They come right to your face. I'm going to get you fired. I'm going to accuse you of of sexual harassment, which is what a black chick accused O'Reilly of. I'm going to get you kicked out of your job like this lady did when a guy was reading Notre Dame against the Klan, a book where the church was fighting against the Ku Klux Klan and he was reading about his church's history. He gets suspended. Don't dare use the wrong word. A guy got suspended from his job for using the word niggardly, which means miserly. See, sometimes words can sound a lot alike. You know, like forget you. (laughs) And I could use other things. So, but people get so hypersensitive about it because that's what the left wants now. They want you at a level of sensitivity where anything can set it off. Careers can be ruined at the blink of an eye. So, Ben Carson in today's world can become a racist. Stacey Dash is a black white supremacist. And George Zimmerman is a white Hispanic. What else has been flipped? Gay marriage doesn't even exist. But if you fight against it, then you got a problem. Black lives matter, blatantly racist. But if you say all lives matter, you're the racist. But these people think they make sense. They make no sense. Let me get to a couple of fan letters. So, Kevin, I'm a 15-year veteran educator who left my job. $110,000 a year because of horrific politics, corrupt administration, and failing policies that are literally killing kids in public education right now. I understand every word you said on Tucker Carlson, and you are dead on. I left my school district because we were overrun with Hispanic illegals, and the schools were out of control and way overpopulated. I could not afford to live there anymore on a single income because the school budget got so out of control with prime example of corporate greed that it's literally mind-blowing. To think I could not afford to live in the area where I worked and grew up with a triple-figure salary. Something is seriously wrong. So she goes on to talk about various issues that she had. I don't know her name. It was a lady that wrote to me about this. And she'd seen my segment on Tucker. Another guy said this, Kevin, saw you on Tucker Carlson's show. Sir, you are on point with your assessment of the NAACP dummies. Tried to get help from them in several cases. We were one of the largest black landscape contractors in San Antonio from 1979 until 85. That we were forced out of business by the home builders hiring Mexican nationals or undocumented Mexicans for a fraction of what we were paid, which was wasn't much uh, due to being black in business. I went to the NAACP, uh, NAACP for help against these large companies for racism. They were not interested. Our kids in the blacks and our kids in the black are failing so far behind in this present society. I hired two black kids that were in high school, gave them instructions to put a toilet together so that. And they couldn't read the instructions. Folks, this is the norm. We'll be back. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. 
My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. All right, everybody, welcome back. Kevin Jackson here. So we've got a smoking gun. We talked a little bit the other day about Paul Manafort and the fact that they've gone back now to 2006 to look at Manafort's records. What, what could he, what, where was Trump at 2006? Do, probably hosting his show, right? I don't think he was looking to run for president in 2006. He had not endorsed Obama, but said, hey, I wish the guy success or whatever. Then he watched Obama torpedoing the country you know, over a period of time, that's when he decided to run. But it was what well into like probably 2010, maybe 2011 Trump went, you know what? I can do a better job than this dude. So he decided to make a, a bid, a presidential bid, but 2006, I don't know what his dealings would have been with Manafort. He obviously knew the guy, but come on, nothing going on here. Nothing sinister, but we've got an update, a smoking gun. Mm-hmm. Hold on to your britches. <laughs> Rappers, that's pants, okay? Just in case you didn't hear me correctly. Where we last left off, this boondoggle that Mueller has mounted against Manafort, you know, the special prosecutor that's looking into these allegations of wrongdoing or connection or whatever. Uh, he was in 2006 dealing with the, with Manafort's Russia by way of Ukraine dealings. So we're not even talking about Russia per se. We're talking about Ukraine. Now, it's hard to believe that a businessman such as Paul Manafort would be doing such a thing, would be hobnobbing with the Russians. Because after all, according to the left, doing business with, business rather with Russia is taboo. That is unless you are a crooked, twice failed presidential candidate like Hillary Clinton or a surrogate thereof. Now, we've talked to you about Podesta and his obvious dealings with Russia. The obvious ties to the Kremlin, the obvious meetings of Hillary Clinton in an official capacity, nonetheless, with Vladimir Putin. No problem at all. Manafort didn't meet with Putin. And I'll get to that in just a second. But according to Manafort's emails, which he has readily said, make them available. Willing to say, open these up, let the public see exactly what's going on. Well, we have one. And he wrote in an email that he was willing to provide, quote, private briefings 
about the campaign to a Russian billionaire. And that billionaire is said to have close ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin, according to the U.S. government. Now, I want to stop for just a second. We've got a campaign being run. Manafort, I don't know his dealings. I'm I'm just going to speculate here. He's got friends in Russia that have lots of money. They've got interest in, in seeing their relationships between Russia and the United States improve. I would presume it is the biggest market in the world per capita. And he says, yeah, I'll be happy to brief you on what's going on with the campaign. Now, this billionaire, I love how they had written it up to where he's got close ties to the Russian government. OK, our government says he's got close ties to Putin. So let me ask you this. Do you think Warren Buffett had close ties to Barack Obama? Do you think Soros had close ties to Barack Obama? Do you think Zuckerberg had close ties to Barack Obama? I can name 15 billionaires who had close ties to Barack Obama, and they're not all U.S. billionaires. So the idea here is to paint this as some salacious thing. Well, he had close ties to Putin. Who cares? Who do you think billionaires have close ties to? Pookie? Billionaires have close ties to people of power. There's a reason why people seek to get power. They want to be around the hobnobbers. Now, I don't seek to get power, but I do want to be around the hobnobbers because they have nice toys. When I got flown by private jet from Vancouver to Masset, it it didn't take that. But I knew then and there that I like that life. (laughs) I don't have the power of that gentleman, but I have access to him. So I'd be crazy not to want to be around it, but I don't crave it. I'm not sitting around going, oh, my gosh, man, I really need to have more power. You know, whatever. Here's my point. A billionaire has access to Putin. Big deal. I'll tell you this. The guy who's running drugs or selling bootleg vodka, hooch on the streets of Russia, he doesn't have access to Putin. So who was Manafort going to meet with? That guy or a billionaire who's in the aluminum business. Yeah, the sinister aluminum business is what this Russian was into. Yep. So you can do business with everybody else, but not the Russians. Oh, unless you're a Democrat, then the left doesn't seem to care. Tempting to meet with a potential can, uh, contact, rather, who might be able to, you know, I don't know, he heals some wounds that Obama created during his administration. Who knows? None of us do. Same thing Clinton did. Same thing Obama did, except with respect to anything Trump's involved in. He's not looking to feather his nest. That's what I love about the guy being a billionaire. As much as politics shouldn't be for sale. And Donald Trump certainly made that clear when he ran his campaign for half the cost of Hillary and he had more money, he said, I'm just going to let the people do it. I'll play by the rules, but I'll let the people do it. And our objective is to win. So who is this Russian in question? His name is Oleg Deraspaka, a metal magnet. I told you guys, he's involved in aluminum. Aluminum, folks. Not precious gold, you know, not precious other precious metals like gold or silver or platinum. No aluminum, not even titanium. (laughs) So Manafort completely open about his emails, telling the DOJ, release them. And to that end, Manafort spokesperson Jesse Maloney confirmed that the email exchanges were legit, but he says no meeting ever occurred even. So big deal, no harm, no foul. But even if the meeting had occurred, there would have been no harm, no foul, because that's what they do. And I love how Newsmax put it, because they're, they're a leftist rag. They come off to be conservative, but they're not. The July 7th email came a little over a week before the Republican National Convention, while Manafort was leading the Trump campaign's day-to-day operations. It occurred about a month after Manafort attended a meeting with the Russian lawyer at Trump Tower. That meeting was brokered by Donald Trump Jr., who was told in emails that the meeting was part of a Russian government e- effort to help his father's campaign. Nice attempt by Newsmax to connect the dots that lead to nowhere. Chris Ruddy, you should be ashamed of yourself. A multimillionaire posing as a conservative and making money off of conservatives who actually believe that that crap over there is some kind of 
conservative outlet. It's not. Trump Jr. and Manafort offered all the evidence in this matter, unlike crooked Hillary Clinton. Clinton, by the way, continues to hide in plain sight as her dealings with the Russians need no research. We know what she did. So Manafort's turned over thousands of pages, nothing to implicate him in anything other than business as usual. Nothing would allow the DOJ to target President Trump. And what does Mueller do? He does it and goes back to 2006. It has nothing to do with Trump. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. So is universal basic income a sensible safety net or an economic disaster in the making? Now, perhaps surprisingly, Charles Murray, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, is an advocate. And I spoke to him about it recently. Have a look. Charles, thank you so much for talking to us about this. I was very excited when I heard that we could have this conversation because... For most people, this idea of a universal basic income is something that's associated with the left. More recently, we've had the liberal uh, elite in Silicon Valley pushing the idea, but generally it's something that's seen as an idea that comes from the left. But you're obviously not from the left, far from it. No. Just uh, make the case for this from the conservative point of view. Well, the simplest case from the conservative point of view is that the current system is awful, and replacing it all just by giving people money is better. That was Milton Friedman's argument. He Mm -hmm. made this case a long time ago. That's part of my reason. But the main reason is, well, I got a couple. One is I think we're going to see a revolution in the job market over the next 20 or 30 years Mm -hmm. that are going to require us to redefine what the meaning of a job is. I'm in a minority on that. I have a lot of economist friends who say this time is not different and so forth, but I believe that. Uh, The second thing is that we've got to revive American civil society. Mm -hmm. By civil society, I mean communities solving their own problems, dealing with with each other, all the things that made America a very special place. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. That was a gentleman from the American Enterprise Institute talking about a concept called universal basic income. And he's obviously proposing $10,000 minimum per year per person. I don't know if it's like man, woman, and child. Can you imagine? I just want to stop you for one second. Can you imagine a 13-year-old girl saying, I could get $10,000 for myself and I can get $10,000 for my baby? So she's at twenty grand with her kid and think she's making money. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, there's a woman right now that's on welfare. She's getting, uh, they said this woman's worth, she's six figures. She's got like 10 kids. Seems like a lot to you got to feed them and take care of them and get them stuff. But if you don't want to get them stuff, if you just want to have kids, then congratulations. You have succeeded. You are doing quite well for yourself. I just, I, I find this amazing. Like This is where we are with this. Wow. Zuckerberg said, following a trip to Alaska, the that's when it hit him that giving people subsistence, he supported what Alaska calls the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend, which pulls money from the state's revenue, oil revenue, and returns it to the residents at the end of the year. And in 2016, that dividend is it was $1,022 per eligible resident. Now, what is an eligible resident? Probably somebody who worked. I don't know how they did it. I'd have to look it up. But I would presume it's somebody that worked that was productive in society. And oh, by the way, this isn't a revolutionary idea. (laughs) Giving taxpayers their money back and Zuckerberg thinks he's come up with something new. Let me tell you something. I'd be happy to give my $10,000 back. But I would have earned it. What Zuckerberg is saying is whether you work or you don't work, you should have it. Now, the guy from AECI says, the American Enterprise Institute says, well, look, uh, if you happen to lose your job, you have that $10,000. Okay, so you have your 800 bucks a month. Do you still get unemployment? Is is that what he's saying? Again, 
If you want to tell me the government should be giving us back our money, I'll gladly take it. But I won't take it under the guise that the government is giving me money. The government is returning money to me that I've spent. Let me tell you something. I have left in the treasury of this government well over $100,000 in my lifetime. And I did it because I said to myself, you're a good citizen, Kev. I filed my taxes late and they'd owe me, you know, $5,200 one year, $3,700 the next year. I wouldn't even get it. And then it would expire because you only have three years to file. I'd have four years it would expire and I'd collect for three years. This happened recently. I had three or four tax years that expired. It was at least $35,000. The reason I did it at the time was I didn't need the money. I was like, you know what? They can have it. And then I needed the money. And I would have loved to have petitioned the government to say, what do you mean? You can get money that I owe you for as long as you need. But if I don't collect mine within X number of years, you get to keep it. What kind of system is that? That system stinks because I needed the money. Anyway, Zucker, uh, he uses, I'm reading this article. He used his experience at Facebook to explain how economics of human condition can change for the better if people are giving a basic, given a basic income to live off, such as the permanent fund dividend in Alaska. They're getting $1,022, Zuckerberg. How's that going to do it? That's a rebate to everything. The government is saying, look, we made a bunch of money. You need it back. It isn't our money. We're not a profit center. Here's your money back. Now go put it back to work, Alaska. Zuckerberg's getting it twisted. Now look, I know there are places overseas. Uh, well, I'll say not Finland. Um, can't think of the country, but they have a universal basic income. Good for them. Tell me you want to live there. Tell me a leftist. Pick that country, Zimbabwe. We've got a universal uh, basic income. Go live there. See if that's going to help. Let me tell you something. If you told me, Kevin, I'm going to give you $10,000 to live on in the event that you get unemployed, you get $10,000. Man, let me tell you, I look at you like you're crazy. What, is that supposed to entice me? That's a bunch of money or something? That's ridiculous. Now, if you tell me it's extra money we're giving back because you've paid, overpaid your taxes, then fine. And if you even wanted to prorate it and say, look, if you make half a million dollars a year, you don't need your 10 grand back. But if you're working and you've paid taxes and you've been a productive member of society and they said to me, we'll give you up to $10,000 back because the government has been crazy. It's been ridiculous. We've been spending money like drunken sailors and and we have paid off our debts and we don't want to run money in the, you know, a a surplus, which we shouldn't because government is not in that business. Then give me our money back. But the government is in no position to do this, by the way. Zuckerberg wants to do it. The guy who owns Salesforce.com. All these Silicon Valley guys are talking about doing it. Let's give the money back, man. Give people basic income. It's like the $15 an hour minimum wage, the $31,000 a year job flipping burgers. How long is that going to last? So they're the ones saying, let's give the money back. Zuckerberg, a gazillion billionaire, right? This guy is worth billions. One of the rich, he may be, I think he is the richest guy in the world. I know he's one of them. Bezos, uh, the Salesforce.com guys, these are all guys worth billions of dollars. Do they practice what they preach? Give your money to your employees. I have a friend who sold his company for $150 million. Made money. Everybody kept their jobs. People were feasting. You know, got their bonuses, etc. Then my friend took 50 million of those dollars. And he gave them to the employees. (laughs) People don't do that. Now that's putting your money where your mouth is. So Zuckerberg says, seeing how Alaska put the, the dividend in place reminded me of a lesson I learned early at Facebook. Organizations think profoundly differently when they're profitable than when they're in debt. When you're losing money, your mentality is largely about survival. But when you're profitable, you're confident about your future and you look for opportunities to invest and grow further. Alaska's economy has historically created this winning mentality, which has led to the basic income. That may be a lesson for the rest of the country. You are exactly right, Zuckerberg. Positive thinking uh, yields positive results. So why is it your ilk is always making black folks, for example, feel negative? 
Why is it you're always making women feel less than what they are? You don't make enough money, young lady. There's a war on women. Why are you telling Latinos they're hated when they come over here? We embrace them when they come legally. When they don't, we want Americans to have jobs. Why is it that you're beating up on the legal immigrants and giving the pass to the other ones? I mean, I could go on. These people are idiots, folks, and they think because they get a lot of money, they're smart. A lesson for the rest of the world. He goes to one place and suddenly there's a lesson. Now, here's what's ironic. Joe Biden disagrees with him. He came out against the basic, the universal basic idea. He says our children and grandchildren deserve the promise we've had, the skills to get ahead, the chance to earn a paycheck, to earn a paycheck. And a steady job that rewards hard work. See, what Zuckerberg doesn't want you to know is that feeling you get of accomplishment when you do a job, and particularly when you do it well, when you learn more. I can put it in the terms of my little boy in his baseball game. The other day they played a game. They've been beating everybody. They lost their first game, but they're beating everybody. But they took him out at catcher because they're trying these kids in other positions. And I have never, I, you know, watch a lot of baseball with him. Without him behind the plate, it's a different ball game. This kid is a maniac behind the plate. They put other kids back there. They don't get it, but he gets it. And you can see the joy when he goes, boy, I'm glad coach put me behind the plate because we almost lost that game. That's the feeling you want kids to experience. Now, that other kid, I'm glad that he got a chance to try and he'll be good at something, but he's not as good at that. And maybe that'll give him incentive. How about that, Zuckerberg? Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. It's Kevin Jackson Show, kjradio.com. <laughs> couple stories we're going to talk about today. I absolutely love, I absolutely love this story. It involves an octogenarian. Funny dude. 83-year-old man minding his own business in his home. Suddenly, he hears something up on his roof. He's like, what the heck is that? Cops had been called. They surround this house. He's, he can't figure this out. This story, folks, addresses so much. This story I'm about to share about this 83-year-old fighter. <laughs> if this doesn't invigorate you, I don't know what will. It involves trespassing law enforcement and a man that finally gets fed up the same way you are. It reminds me of immigration. It really does. And you'll see why. See, because immigration is something that we shouldn't even be talking about with respect to the illegal version. It's like talking about a home invasion and saying, well, the uh, the uninvited guest. (laughs) Is that what you would call somebody that's broken into your home? Like you come home and there are people in your home. Would you call them uninvited (laughs) guests? I don't think so. Particularly if they were removing things from your property. Or if they were just sitting around and making themselves at home. Maybe the a young couple sitting on the couch necking. Uh, an older couple's in the bedroom watching TV cuddled up in your bed. And some big dude's looking inside of your refrigerator and looks back as you guys come in and says, Oh, this y'all's place? Would you feel like they were uninvited guests 
Would you feel like they were trespassers? Would you feel it all after you start stop shooting? <laughs> anyway, this old man cracks me up. Here's a story from Fox News. A California grandfather, they say, took matters into his own hands when a stranger jumping on rooftops caused an hour-long police standoff on Tuesday. Willard Burgess, 83, was at his La Puenta house when the suspect were uh, the police were cha- chasing uh, stood on his roof, refusing their orders to come down for hours. L.A. County Sheriff's uh, Captain Tim Mur- Murakami wrote on Twitter. Now, if you you got to see this video, this guy's up on it's a you know like one of these little frame houses. I don't know, like a I don't I call it a ranch. It was a single story house. Guy climbs up there. Old man, you see a ladder, and this old man starts to get up on the ladder. And this younger guy, I don't know, who, you know, kids really see, but the old guy, he, it was surprising how well he climbed this ladder at 83 years old. He gets up top and he's talking to this guy like, what are you doing on my roof? Ah! And he's just barking at him and the guy, ah! and he goes, get off my roof. And he's, he put, you know, chases, not chases him, but, you know, walks him fast in a direction where he, it's another, where the roof kind of goes up maybe two feet, you know, rises up and the guy kind of stops him, and the old man just kind of grabs him by the collar walks him over to the edge and tosses him off, you know, eight feet, nine feet, whatever on the, you could hear a thud, like, like he hit a car, you know, parked in the driveway. It may have been a police cruiser. Honestly, you got to see it. It's amazing. And you just hear him talking to, and then you see a police officer that came up behind the old man, like, you know, Hey, 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 as he's on the roof about to toss the guy. And before the cop can do anything, the old man tosses him off. Just get out of here. I love this story. See, this is a perfect example. This is like, think of the um, the Border Patrol, and they're standing around. The illegals coming in, coming in, coming in, and finally some citizen says, you know what, I'm just going to start kicking these suckers out. And he grabs them, and he throws them back into the Rio Grande and says, you're not going to get to swim on this side of the river, and throws them in. And the Border Patrol is coming up behind going, sir, sir, you can't do it, you can't do it. Why not? My country, in his case, he's saying, you're allowing a fool to disrupt my life, to dance on my roof. Who I don't know what's it going to cost me, this knucklehead dancing on my roof. Are you going to pay for it? Are the citizens going to pay for it? This fool shouldn't be on my roof. If he gets on my roof, he's on my property. If he's on my property, I'm going to throw his butt off. And he threw him down eight feet or nine, whatever the size of the roof was, he threw him down onto a car. He didn't land on the ground. He landed on a cruiser. It's so four feet, five feet, whatever it was. Anyway, uh, here's what they say. He said, uh, that sucker's coming off. He told police. <laughs> that was when that cop was behind him. The grandfather then shoved the man off his roof. This is what uh, Fox News reported. Ending the hours long standoff. It's unclear whether the unidentified man who police say was either mentally ill or on drugs was seriously injured. Police said he was taken to the hospital for a mental evaluation. They don't take him to the hospital for mental evaluations when they come over and sneak into America, do they? You come to my house, you don't have to worry about him because I'll be all over it because I'm going to load up, Burgess told KABC. (laughs) He's now tired of it he's saying i'm no longer going to just go throw him off the roof i'm going to shoot him off the roof let me tell you i don't know how it is yeah i I suspect i mean i'm old enough to know that you didn't go jumping around on people's roofs as a kid i wouldn't have i would have done it once and some old dude would have you know some 40 year old man would have what are you doing up on my roof and I'd, I don't know, sir. And he'd have, came, he'd have come up there and thrown my butt off. And my grandmother would have said, well, good. I'm glad he did. Why would you do it? What were you doing? I'm on his roof anyway. We That was when we had common sense in America. I wouldn't go on his roof. But if I did, he would have thrown me off. And my parents would have said, yeah, well, you know what? I'm glad he did. You shouldn't have been up there. We don't have that anymore. Let me tell you what you're thinking already. I promise you I know this. You are going, how long before they sue this old man, right? Was he even thinking about that? 
He's throwing a guy off his roof. He could be sued by this guy. Don't be surprised, folks, if we update this story and the guy who was thrown off the roof suddenly finds his sanity, gets off his drugs, and they tell him what happened. Somebody says, you ought to sue that old fart, and he sues him. So what he wasn't hurt? So what he was trespassing? So what he should be in jail, off drugs? He should be thanking that old man. You think they're going to thank him? Burgess's granddaughter, Ashley Wren, recorded the cell phone video of the moment <laughs> Burgess tossed the man off the roof. She's actually got the video that could get her grandpa, <laughs> you know, broke. My neighbor, Albert, got a ladder. My grandfather climbed the ladder quick. He pushed the guy to the corner of the roof and threw him off the roof, Wren told the San, San Gabriel Valley Tribune. The man was then handcuffed after he fell. It was a crazy morning, she said. I bet it was. Let me tell you about crazy mornings. Every day. You wake up to a crazy morning every single day of your life. You want to know why? Because liberals are on your roof. They're dancing. They're partying. And you know what they're partying with? (laughs) Your stuff. They've already been in the house. They've got your cooler on the roof. They got your, your, uh, your Amazon, whatever the thing that plays music for you now. Because, yeah, that's, well, I hope you don't have an Amazon, but they have your music source. Let's put it that way. They may have even rolled up your TV. They got your recliner. They even got, they're even petting your dog. And they are all up on your roof and they are dancing. And when they're not dancing on your roof, they're dancing on your grave because they're happy that you've paid money to them because you left a bunch of money to them. So you paid money. And so they're dancing, you know, through your inheritance and they're dancing on your grave. They're dancing on everything that you stand, that you love. That's essentially it. They're dancing on it all. (laughs) Yeah, crackheads is what they're, and you, you're funding their habit, but you don't just fund their drug habit. You buy them clothes. (laughs) You've bought them that recliner. You bought the beer they're drinking, the chips they're eating, the nachos, the wine, whatever. And you finance the football game they watch with cable TV and other nonsense. They are laughing at you. And you know what you're going to need to do? You're going to need to get off your butt, (laughs) get your neighbor's ladder, no matter how old you are, go up on that roof and reclaim your property. Toss them off. Because that's what's happening to us every single day. There's a metaphor for all of this stuff, folks. There really is. And if, until we stop allowing this nonsense, and I, I, again, I use this as a metaphor the, of illegal immigration. Until we stop allowing that, until we stop allowing refugee resettlements back because Trump got his travel order. Now they're like, well, will he let it expire? Let's hope not. Have you seen the Cutter commercials where they're saying, we are not condoning terror. We want to be part of the United, you know, blah, blah, blah. Please lift the, cut, the travel ban to the United States. You know why people want to get here? They want to see what it's like. They want to know what it takes to be a successful country. Make them beg. And for the ones who get here illegally, kick them off your roof. Because that's the way we survive as a country. won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. everybody kevin jackson here it is the kevin jackson show glad you're with me 844-551-8255 if you want to share voice with me (laughs) so i want to start uh, this hour with a story about the mad pooper (laughs) oh man some stories have leftism written all over it this happened in colorado springs which tells you a lot because uh look denver colorado Springs, big bigger cities in any state they are full of leftists colorado springs outside of the air force academy man a haven of leftism and cops are looking for this woman they call her the mad pooper and she's 
been caught defecating in front of houses for weeks. Now, I, when I looked at this story at first, and I thought, is she defecating in front of multiple houses? Now, she's doing this in public. She's out for a jog. I want you to think about this because I go out for a walk with my dog. I take doggy bags, but I don't take toilet paper for myself. I don't know how you guys do. What about you fellas? You, you don't either. No. Okay. Just curious. Maybe baby wipes. <laughs> hey, baby wipes are not dependable. <laughs> don't trust them. <laughs> You'll end up with monkey butt. <laughs> so, Anyway, this woman, she goes out for a jog. Look, and that brings up another thing. When I, before I go out for a jog, I go ahead and take a dump. I don't like the feeling. You, have, you ever, you, have you ever? I know you've had it. You've had that feeling where you know you got to use the bathroom. That's a terrible feeling. If you know you have to use the bathroom and you can't use it, let's say you're on a jog, it's a horrible experience because you're like, oh, shoot, whoa, no, this is not good. And I'm not talking diarrhea. I'm talking about just, I got to go. I got to take a dump. You cannot operate at full capacity when you have to take a dump. Even if you're sitting around and you're like a writer, you're a writer. You got to take a dump. If you don't take a dump, your writing will suffer. I know this firsthand. And I know I'm not the only human being feeling this way. You must feed the beast, the toilet. Nature calls. You must answer. It's the way we're built. So I can't imagine you're just, okay, I'm going for a run. Ooh. Like, okay, when I get up in the morning, I'm as regular as rain. I got I to gotta do number one and number two. Let's just say I got to do number three because I got to do them both. If I went out and just started running in the morning, I would run less than half a mile, guarantee you, before I have to come back. And I would run that half a mile back a lot faster than I ran it going. You get what I'm saying? And it wouldn't be because I feel good. It would be because I got to hustle and get back. But this lady, she goes for a run. Don't know how far. Looks like a, I mean, yeah, it's just like a, a, the shot they showed of her. You can't really see her very well, but a lady saw her. Kathy Buddy, Buddy or B-U-D-D-E. She told KKTV, the unidentified woman has been relieving herself in front of their Colorado Springs home for at least seven weeks. Her children even caught the, they've dubbed, they've dubbed this lady, the mad pooper. They caught her squatting with her pants down in front of the house. Now, I don't know if she's doing number one or number two, because how do you squat that quick? Get up and start running. All I can say is occupy wall street. Ooh, Hillary Clinton. Ooh, you know what I mean? How do you, how do you do that? Pop up and go, see ya. Like, you know, you get caught. You don't even get the wipe. I mean, you get what I'm saying? I'm not trying to build a visual for you. You understand me. I already know you people out there going, Kevin, we get it. We get it. We get it. She says they are like, there's a lady taking a poop. So I come outside and I'm like, are you serious? This is what she told KKTV, buddy, Kathy, buddy. Are you really taking a poop right here in front of my kids? She's like, yeah, sorry. I would like to know more from Booty, which kind of is funny that her name would be Booty or Buddy. I'm, I'm calling her Buddy, but it could be Booty, which would be really funny. Ironic. Booty said the incident happens at least once a week for seven weeks. She catches the woman and all the woman says is, yeah, sorry. No, do you uh, look, I'm, I'm not one for violence. I, I, I know how to provide protection against violence. I've been trained to do it, but I'd run this lady down and say, Hey, what's your problem? Did you bring a poop bag? Get your stuff up at the very least. I'm going to make sure I know who you are. And I say, next time you poop in front of my house, I'm going to hit you with a BB gun. <laughs> Come on. Seriously. Once a week, this she says she recalled catching the jogger doing her business last week. She said the woman changed up her time a bit because she knew the family was watching. This woman is alternating her time to go poop in another lady's home and doing it in such a way that she's 
Okay, let me put this a different way. So there's poop in your home the first time. And you go, what the heck? Who let their dog do this? That's number one. Then you catch it. You go, oh, the kids are like, mommy, mommy, mommy. And you come out and you're like, what the heck are you doing? Oh, sorry. Boom. Then she changes up her time and there's poop in your yard again. You're no longer thinking it's the dog. It's kind of like when somebody, you know, farts. And the dog doesn't make a movement and, and, you, and you know, you get what I'm saying. You're not going to just keep beating the dog. You're going to go, okay, stop, Kevin. Just stop it. <laughs> and I'm going to look over at you and go, what? And laugh, right? Because I'm the one doing it. At this point, you know this lady is the one leaving these piles in your yard. It doesn't matter if she's sneaking them in at 1 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If there's a pile there now, it's no longer blaming the neighborhood's Great Dane. The neighbor's great Dane. I'd run her down. I'd make her pick it up. I'd find out where she lives and I'd make sure there's a lot of poop in her yard. Lady says, I put a sign on our wall. That's like, please, I'm begging you, please stop. She says she's run by it 15 times and, uh, and then still poops. See, this is liberalism. Please stop it. I put a sign up. Uh, be like that 83 year old dude I was telling y'all about that threw the guy off the building. You go grab that lady and rub her nose and throw her down on the ground and rub her head in. And you know how you, that's how you can train a dog not to do the doo doo in your, in his kin or, you know, in his pen or on your floor. You rub his nose in it. He says it's abnormal. This is what the cop says. I, I've never seen this in my career. Well, you have now, Mr. Police Officer. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Uh, I was reading Newsmax, the fake conservative rag, and they, well, they send me stuff every day, and I keep up with them just because I used I used to do hits on their program, and uh, there's a there's a couple of good people over there. Don't misunderstand me, but it's not a conservative uh, outlet. It just flatly isn't. And I proved it to a friend of mine one time. I said, just look at the headlines. I go, the headlines are tell you everything because they give you the first impression of the article. And whether it's good or bad, if Trump did good or bad, the headline will be bad. And then you might get to the article and like, you know, like it'll be Trump embarrasses at the U.N. And hey, even though people are happy about it, Trump, you know, a lot of people are saying he's an embarrassment. They never write it from a not even a neutral perspective. 
They write it from a leftist perspective. Anyway, um, they were touting Hillary's downloads to her book and her uh, the number of books. she I think they said she sold 800,000 books. That's the report. No, that's not what she sold. That's what's been printed. And I have to tell you, you when it comes to the Clintons, you got to understand what you're dealing with. You got to understand that everything is orchestrated and contrived. So I talked about Hillary getting these set up questions with NPR that she later came back to to untalk about all the things she's talking about on her book tour are quite frankly, there's nothing new. There's nothing salacious. There's nothing that talks about the controversy. It's all what happened. And, and, and let me promise you this. The people that are buying this drivel are getting these books at cost so that the numbers will rack up because they got to make Hillary look like she's relevant when she's not. So they said they they printed. Uh, they were they were very clear. They printed eight hundred thousand books. You haven't talked about how many they sold. See, I think Simon and Schuster carries this one. Whoever it is, it's carrying the book. They look at it as Hillary's maybe a she may be a lost leader. Now they lost a fortune on hard choices, but they go it may be a lost leader, but it keeps us in the news, and that free press is worth it. Simon and Schuster, Hillary Clinton. Oh yeah, we did Hillary's book. So they'll go out and get a a book they will actually sell. Like they'll go to, I don't know, the chick that wrote Harry Potter and go, we'd love to have your next book. We did Hillary Clinton. Oh, you did Hillary Clinton's book. So they'll use Hillary as a loss (laughs) in order to, you know, to feather their nest with this, with the other stuff. I don't know. I mean, what gets me is in the downloads, I think they, they said, I forget how many, because Newsmax reported it and it's a respectable number, but it isn't a respectable number for somebody with her clout. They're not going to get, they're not going to get their money back on that number. Guys, something's uh, bugging me, making my nose, um, you know, where I can't talk. Is there somebody like whoever did it? Just try to find it. Cause it's bugging me right now. Anyway, I love that. Um, Hillary won't, contest the election that was the news we reported now again npr she says you know what i don't know the mechanism involved it could be maybe maybe brighter minds in mine might be able to figure it out but i'm not one to contest then she clarified her statement the other day which was left more ambiguity because essentially she said you know i don't know if there's a case Uh, i'm not one to be talking about it maybe it could be i'm not sure but i don't think there's a constitutional way you know so what she says is you know i believe i'm president but there's no way for me to technically prove it so we have to just kind of leave things as they are and you know what i'm not going to contest the election and i'm thinking to myself you got to be pretty bold and pretty pretty bold pretty brazen to be sitting here the loser I mean, a complete loser, two time loser. And you're implying that, you know, I still have a a legal remedy. Should I want to be president? First of all, Hillary. Oh, one of the things she said was like, you know, she referenced Kenya. We talked about this the other day. She referenced Kenya as if, well, if we did the election again, the way they did in Kenya, things could be different. Let me tell you something, Hillary Clinton. If they redid the election today, poll numbers, whatever you say about Donald Trump, He would beat you worse than he did. That's what would happen. There's a part of me that wants to, you know, that wishes you could prove it. We could just go out and say, let's do a mock election. That's that, you know, we look at, did we treat validly? I would love to see this. This woman is full of herself. So the idea that I won't contest the election, I'm just going to let, you know, things stay. You know, it is my right, maybe, to contest, I'm not sure, but I'm going to leave it alone because I have no other choice. Because nobody wants you. I don't, guys, I don't know how to tell Hillary Clinton or anybody else on the left this except to just be blunt. Hillary Clinton has lost so many Democrats because they finally got to see what a hypocrite she is. She cheated Bernie and then. In telling Donald Trump, you should, you know, we should respect our electoral process, blah, blah, blah. She lied when she lost. And 
and says, well, I won the popular vote, and now she's attacking the electoral vote. She's got minions talking about, we don't need the electoral college. This is awful, blah, blah, blah. And people wonder how Trump won. There was a leftist. He tried to explain the appeal of Donald Trump's U.N. speech. And uh, here's what he wrote. The big idea for many of the presidents, of the president's core supporters, his appeal has always been more about tone than substance. I'll tell you this. Nothing could be further from the truth about me. I've never cared about Trump's tone. I've cared about the substance. Build a wall. Protect our borders. Make America great again. America first. Bring business back. Less regulation, less government. He, his, his delivery is horrible, generally speaking. What this fool wants us to believe is that, you know, it's been about tone. Let me tell you about tone versus substance. That was the epitome of Barack Obama. Style versus substance. But you could substitute the word tone. Style over substance. I would love to have these guys tell me what Barack Obama did of consequence. If you're gay or you're Muslim, you might have a few things to talk to me about. But outside of that, nothing that helped the public as a whole. In fact, most of the policies that Barack Obama did hurt us. They made us less safe. They made us more vulnerable uh, from a financial perspective. We, I mean, there are people that can't afford health care. And that was going to be his legacy. We talked a little bit about it yesterday that his his, his uh, Obamacare looks like it's finally maybe going to gonna die. And I don't know whether that's his Trump reaching out to the left and then finally saying, look, let's give a little to get a little. I, I, it's not for me to, to I, mean, I certainly don't know. I can, I can speculate because that is my job. But whatever the case, we're finally getting something done that I hope is going to impact us. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about the left is trying to explain Donald Trump's appeal. And then I want to give you a feel good story of something that happened a while back with the LGBT community that really set relations in America back quite a ways, but it looks like it's correcting itself. So stick around. We'll be back. This is the Kevin Jackson radio show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Glad you're with me. So I, I found it laughable that Hillary Clinton says she won't contest the election as if that's even a possibility. That's the thing that just gets me. It's like, well, you know, I won't. Not that there, I mean, it, there's not a constitutional way I could do it. And, you know, she's hemming and hawing. The fact of the matter is that you there's nothing to contest. <laughs> even if you had the ability to contest it, which technically she does. You're not going to do it, and you're not doing us a favor by not contesting. You know, I'm going to do America a favor and not contest it. Let's just pres- let's pretend that Donald Trump is really president, and I'm not. It's so funny to listen to her. And then I I wanted I, I got started out talking a little bit about this appeal that Donald Trump has at the UN that the left doesn't recognize. And this one guy wrote. The big idea for many of President Trump's core core supporters, his appeal has always been more about tone than substance. And I got into what are you talking about? If there's any president that's been about substance, it's Donald Trump. But it just goes to show you how distorted the left remains. He says this commentators often misunderstood his 2016 success by overly focusing on the specific specific policies he's proposing. Uh, I'll get it out in a second. What is the deal with speaking today? To borrow one trite formulation, the media took Trump literally while voters took him seriously. Many Republicans who backed Trump in the primaries were willing to overlook his apostasies on the issues they theoretically care about most, such as abortion or guns, because they liked his style. What do you mean? See, this is this gets me. Donald Trump is anti-abortion. He understands that pro-life, it's not really his decision, but he, and he said it. He, he absolutely said, look, I can't tell women what to do, but I am 
for I, I don't I find abortion abhorrent. That's what he said with his own mouth. I mean, it may not have been exactly those words, but it was along those lines. And guns? What are you talking about? This dude is pro gun. What's, what does he want Donald Trump to do? To go out and license new gun manufacturers? I mean, I don't even know what... How could he prove to be more guns than he is already? The dude has been seen with the guns. He's, he's, there is no legislation you will pass that will pass Donald Trump's desk that in, infringes on the rights of gun owners. Nothing. What are they talking about? He goes on to say this. The brashness bellicosity, swagger, machismo, whatever you want to call it, that made so many elder statesmen so uncomfortable was central to his success. Let me tell you what all that was. That was a guy who said, I will not apologize to you for being successful. I will not apologize to you for any mistakes I've made in life that don't involve you. That's why Donald Trump won, was because he said, you know what? I'm a flawed human being. And you may look at me and go, he's an egomaniac or he's whatever. But you know what? It's my life. I've led it. And if being successful makes you uncomfortable, sorry for you because it shouldn't. You should be happy to live in a country where you can enjoy this type of success. You can take an investment and get this out of it. You can raise a family like I have Divorces notwithstanding, look at my family. Ex-wives that still deal with him. Ex-girlfriends that speak highly of him. Business partners that still are involved with him. If Trump was the ogre they made him out to be, how could he possibly have done so well? So Trump said, in your face. And he didn't leave, he didn't leave it to chance. He, whenever they attacked him, he attacked harder. Let me tell you something. My son, I don't know if you've seen this movie called The Accountant. I can't stand Ben Affleck, but this, uh, I only watch it because it's on regular TV now. But uh, anyway, there's a scene where his dad teaches the boys how to fight. And he tells his son, you're either going to fight, learn, his kids are picking on him. He's like, you're either going to fight, it's like four kids, or you're going to be a chump all your life. And he says to him, which are you going to do? And the little boy gets out of the car, walks over, and he's autistic. But he's learned, his dad has taught him how to fight paid for him to learn how to fight and the little kid goes over you're thinking to yourself he's a meek little dude and man you should see the scene that scene is kevin jackson in one little snippet (laughs) he immediately goes over to the guy who was giving him the grief and i mean this kid just and i mean he hits him so fast it's crazy the other kid grabs him from behind he kicks another guy gets away from him it starts, hits a second kid. He goes down. The other kid takes off running and his brother jumps out of the car to run that kid down. That is me and my brother fighting for each other right there. That is us, you know, saying, okay, it's yours. It's yours to start, but I got your back. There's only four of them. My brother wouldn't even have to get out of the car for four of them. But so anyway, he, you got to see that scene. That's I saw that scene. And I said to myself, I brought my 10 year old. I said, let me show you this scene. If this movie, if you watch nothing else of this movie, you're going to watch this scene. So Donald Trump got out of the car and went over and started beating the crap out of everybody in the system. He beat up the left. He beat up the rhinos. He beat up the media, the establishment, the Black Lives Matter, all of them, all of the special interests, the gays, the the feminist. He just started whooping everybody. And you know what you did? You got out of the car and as they started running away, you chased them. Good for you. This guy goes on to say this. Many conservatives feel like the system in Washington and the world is broken. They don't want leaders to prevaricate or speak the language of diplomacy. They want a street fighter. (laughs) I hadn't even read that before I told you guys what happened in that movie. Seriously. So he goes on to say that we saw that street fighter at the UN, particularly after we had seen Trump cutting these deals with Chuck and Nancy. It had a lot of, a lot of people going, wait, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Now, those are the, the novices, the people that don't understand politics. Trump is Trump. Let Trump be Trump. That's what uh, Lewandowski's book is going to be. 
But Trump is Trump. He cutting deals with Nancy and Chuck. If you believe Donald Trump's going to cut the people that got him elected a bad deal, you you don't know the guy. Just either get off the Trump train or, you know, go learn politics. He's not going to cut a deal. Is he going to is it, are we going to have to give a little to get a little? Sure. Am I happy about that? No. Do what would I do what Trump does? Probably not. But we'll get what we want in the end because that's what ultimately has to happen. Trump takes a piece of land and builds you a magnificent property. That's what he does. So give him the land. He'll build the property. He may have to grease the hands of a few union bosses or whatever, but he'll, you'll get your property. That's what you're looking for, right? Stop looking into the details, guys. Look, I understand the Tea Party movement. I understand what we wanted to accomplish, and we've done a pretty good job. Now we've got a warrior. Trump said this, Rocket Man's on a suicide mission for himself and his regime. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself for its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. I love that talk, because let me tell you something. As much as Trump doesn't want to do that, don't think it's off the table. And don't think that by the time if we have to press that button, that the world won't say, you know what, it's time to press that button. Now, nobody wants to see a nuclear war. Too many innocent people will be killed. But short of that, you'll see that drastic things will happen in North Korea. He goes on to say this, conservatives who praise the speech focus mainly on the way Trump talked about North Korea. John Bolton declared this was the best speech of the Trump presidency because people will remember Trump's threat against Pyongyang. I think he was as clear and direct as it is possible to be. That's what Bolton said. For Americans, plain speaking is still a virtue. There was a lot of plain speaking in that speech. Eric Erickson called it the best speech by President Trump so far, said it was because he did not mince words. A White House contact told me that the president intended to wake up the United Nations to the threat North Korea poses on the world stage by using harsh language. I think it probably worked. Foreign policy elitists treat the president's statements about North Korea and Rocket Man with the same disdain they showed Reagan for his evil empire remarks. But I suspect both presidents will have the last laugh. When president, with President Trump, we're not going to get the soaring rhetoric of Barack Obama or the happy smile and sentiment of George W. Bush, but we we are not going to get Reagan or Clinton. What we're going to get is a blunt instrument who understands he can occasionally use his bluntness to make, bluntness to make real change. Another person wrote, Charles Hurt, said the apology tour is over, praising the strong dose of straight talk. Folks, what you're seeing here, Eric Erickson was a no-Trumper, a never-Trumper is what they called him. And I don't know about these other folks. Bolton probably liked him. But the point I'm making is this. There are people who are never Trumpers who are finally going, you know what? This is what we have to have. They get it. We are not provoking North Korea. This is a madman. And the world has has capitulated. Barack Obama for eight years allowed this man to build nukes that the Clinton administration allowed him to do on paper. And now that time is ended. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com
putting an end to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Talked earlier in the broadcast about the people who benefited during Barack Obama's reign of terror. And the gays certainly were those who got a leg up on the rest of America. Special interest group who got carved out to get a little bigger piece of the pie. The only people who probably benefited more are illegals, illegal Mexicans specifically, but illegals in general. You could argue that refugees, Muslims did pretty well because they got to blow up a few Americans and under the guise of refugee resettlement and the fact that they want to be here to assimilate into our society when in fact they don't. But sometimes things have a way, karma has a way of working itself back around And we've seen cases where gays have become Gestapos against people, just like the uh, women's movement uh, went against companies like Hobby Lobby and uh, Chick-fil-A, who were against paying for contraception as part of the Obamacare mandate. And the left didn't look at the religious principles of these people and say, you know what, Uh, these companies and say they're entitled to that. But had they been a Muslim company, they would have done something and capitulated, but they wouldn't do it for them. There was a point for these uh, gay Gestapo, these Nazis. And, you know, we use this term pretty openly now in politics, but the fact of the matter is these people did act like Nazis. They would just destroy us in terms of our business ventures and things like this. They would destroy us. They would go in intentionally looking for things for You know, to be upset about, oh, you're not serving gay this or gay that. And knowing that, you know, no, you know, look, you can get a service anywhere you choose. But they targeted companies and and they had targeted a baker, if you guys don't remember. But and, and it wasn't one. It were many. In fact, over time, it ended up being others. But it looks like revenge served cold tastes like ice cream. (laughs) I call this. Sweet Revenge, the story we're about to talk about. And I don't know what the gay couple is worth who sued this baker who refused to bake their wedding cake. I don't know whether they're worth thousands of dollars or they're worth millions of dollars or whatever. But whatever it cost him, I hope that it ends up being treble damages to this couple. And I wouldn't even, I don't consider that bad karma, but I hope that they lose everything, to be honest with you. That's the only acceptable karma for these Nazis who dare try to force somebody into indentured servitude for their BS cause. If someone doesn't want to do a service for you because they have a business, the government should not be able to step in and say, you will do this. It's not a government contract. It's a person saying, I reserve the right to refuse service. Uh, Look, if I went into a bakery and he says, Kevin, I'm not baking you a cake. I don't bake cakes for black people. I'd go, no problem. I'd leave. I wouldn't call the NAACP. I would tell friends of mine, have y'all ever been in that bakery? Yeah, you know that one up on such and such? Yeah, he won't bake cakes for black people. I didn't know that. Yeah, he doesn't. And eventually, I'd alert anybody black, don't waste your time in this. And I would even go to the guy and say, hey, you might want to do this so we don't waste our gas and our time and our energy. Say, I only bake cakes for white people. You don't even have to exclude, say, I'm excluding everybody. Just say, I bake cakes for white folks. And I'd be cool because you'll save me the time. But I don't care because you know what? Around the corner from him or up the block, three miles away, whatever, is going to be somebody who's willing to bake me a cake, who wants my money. Now, I get it. People, well, Kevin, if he's got a business, that business should support everybody. I completely agree. And typically it would. And oh, by the way, This business supported gays. The business of the cake baker, it supported gays. You know what that business said? That businessman said, come in here. I don't care about your sexuality. Enjoy my my donuts, my cakes, my cookies or whatever, all my pastries. But if when it comes to baking a wedding cake, I draw the line on that product. He didn't have a sign up that said, I don't bake cakes or sell goodies or whatever to the gays. This case never, repeat, never should have been adjudicated in any way. He was not discriminatory against gays. There are many gays that went to his cake shop and and got cakes that he had on display 
and bought all the other products that I mentioned earlier. But when you want him to bake a wedding cake, he said, I draw the line there because I don't believe in marriage between two men or two women. So that to me is a sacred religious ceremony and I follow my doctrine and the government goes, no, you won't. Barack Obama has to jump in the middle and say, you're not going to do it. And he would rather shut this man down. Now you say, Kevin, why would he shut down the business? Because the principle of it for Barack Obama was bigger than the business. It was, a, it was meant to put a scare throughout all of the businesses in the world. You will capitulate to the gay mafia. And the gay mafia took advantage of it. They went out terrorizing people. I got a gay cake I want you to bake. Bake me a gay cake. Are you going to bake me a gay cake? Are you going to bend up like this guy? They couldn't just be, you know, happy that, you know, okay, so one guy won, you know, terrible thing to shut down a guy's bakery for this reason, blah, blah, blah. No, wasn't good enough. So for the Masterpiece Cake Shop owner, Jack Phillips, who five years ago refused politely to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple, doing it on the basis of religious freedom and that he doesn't believe in gay marriage, it triggered this lawsuit. Gays cannot marry. I don't care what they say. I've already, you guys know my stance on it. I don't care if you be, be happy, be together. I don't care, but you can't be married. It's that simple. Why don't nobody's trying to say that they don't deserve happiness as they define it. But anyway, he gets sued. Pretty simple concept though, that he should be able to invoke his religious freedoms particularly as a business owner and say in that particular area, I don't do such. It would be like me going to a rabbi and saying, will you perform a non-Jewish wedding? And he goes, I can't, I'm not going to perform that wedding. Why not? Because I don't know how to perform your weddings. I perform Jewish weddings or I tell a rabbi, you're going to give me a Jewish wedding, but you're not Jewish. Still, I'm going to marry my gay boyfriend and we're going to come up here and do a Jewish wedding. Or if not, I'm going to shut down your, what do they call it? A synagogue. <laughs> anyway, President Trump threw a wrinkle in their devious plans. The Justice Department filed a brief on behalf of Mr. Phillips. They filed it with the Supreme Court. They're, to, they're due to hear his religious liberty case when the justices return to the bench. And they agreed to hear his repeal. SCOTUS, the Supreme Court, will decide whether or not Phillips discriminated against the gay couple when he invoked his religious objection and legal right as a vendor to refuse to bake their so-called wedding cake. And I've already argued the point. If Phillips says, I don't allow gays in my restaurant, by the way, he could still do that. He'd have no way of knowing, but he could say that, and I would have no problem with that. Other than I would say, what a bigot. What do you care where your money comes from? I think it's short-sighted. But I don't have a problem with him saying, look, guys, you can pick a cake. You can use whatever cake you want. I'm not making a cake for something that goes against my religious convictions. So the Department of Justice filed this amicus brief defending Phillips' decision to refuse service on religious grounds. And in the brief, Acting Solicitor General Jeffrey Wall invoked the First Amendment. He essentially argued that people can't be compelled to create expression for a particular person or entity and to participate literally or figuratively in a ceremony or other expressive event. I mean, this is just bizarre. There was another cake gate incident too, where uh, a girl Trump had won and a high school girl, I think she was about 17 years old, wanted to get him a, get a cake and it, it was a Trump cake. Her name was Mackenzie Gill from Bossier, Paris, Louisiana. She wanted a Trump 2016 cake from Albertson. And then she posted on, on Facebook her disbelief when they didn't want to do it. And here's what she wrote. Just left Albertson's. The woman behind the cake counter just refused me a birthday cake because I wanted Trump 2016 on it. Did that just really happen? And it did. It had just happened. She was venting on Facebook when she made the status and didn't think it was going to get as much attention, but it did. Not as much as the gay cake, but it got some attention. And she said, I just look up the Trump. Now you may be thinking, well, Kevin, you're sort of not making your point here because she's getting a cake made 
and they refuse service. And I'm going, no, I'm not. I'm bolstering my point. I'm actually making a different point. But the fact is she should be able to get that cake because there is no religious conviction. There's nothing to it. She will, that was the president of the United States. But these people, the gays want to go after somebody who has a legitimate objection, but you can buy any other product in their store they want. If, if he refused that, they might have a case, even though in my case, I don't think they do. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show.